constantly amazed at how talented and, uh, in this case, how spiritually astute our musicians are uh, to be able to take a uh, secular play and tie it into the scripture for the Lord. That's just wonderful. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Ted, as well, for all you do for us every week. Our scripture text for today is a continuation of last week's uh, the epistle of uh, Paul to the Romans, chapter 12. Uh, if you would like to follow along, it's on page 162, I believe, of the bulletin, um, in your uh, pew Bible. Would you please stand then and follow along as we read the scripture? Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone evil for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. No, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will keep burning coals on their heads. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, in your presence among us this morning, help us to hear and to understand the words shared by your messenger, Paul. Help our minds and our hearts to work together to bring this message to life. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Last week we read and Pastor Tommy discussed with us the first eight verses of this chapter from Paul's letter. In these verses, Paul challenged members of the church to see themselves as the body of Christ. He talks about members presenting themselves as a living sacrifice. Remember Tommy's discussion of that? And about us being members of one body of Christ. Tommy mentioned different gifts that Paul lists such as teaching and preaching and giving hospitality, to name but a few. Paul tells us that within the church, we are to be one. We are to support each other in ministry. And now we come to the second half of this chapter. And here we see how Paul envisions the church when its members truly act as the body of Christ. It's rather strongly worded and probably represents all that Paul sees as being necessary to genuine faith. It's rooted in love, a thing that Paul goes over and over and over again in his letters to the Corinthians and the Thessalonians and the Philippians. Paul loves to talk about love. But it's also a section that's easy for us to dismiss or to attempt to rationalize because on the surface, some of it makes us cringe. In our time, as in Paul's, the message is one that we have to wrestle with. 
There are times, frankly, when being a Christian is just downright inconvenient, impractical, illogical. It took me a while in, in reading this and, and studying this chapter to realize that chapter 12, the, the passage from today as well as the passage from last week, really only deals with our relationships within the body of Christ. Sometimes I think it's easier if we look at how we deal with people outside of the church. How we react to news of Osama bin Laden or how we react to Muammar Gaddafi, for instance. That's easy. But when we recognize that it is simply within the body of Christ, it actually gets much harder. In chapter 13, by the way, Paul does turn to the outside and he talks about how we as members of the body of Christ deal with those outside of the church. But here, it's about us. It's about us as University Baptist Church. It's about us as part of the wider Christian church. It is about us as American Baptist churches and Alliance of Baptists, but it is also about us and how we treat our brothers and sisters in the Catholic Church next door. And it's about us and how we treat our Christian brothers and sisters at work and at school and in our neighborhoods. The implications are pretty far-fetched. But it is only about us and our relationship within the church. Now the first part of this passage is actually comforting. As Kelly noted, it's about love. It's something that's familiar, and it's something that is easy to listen to. So listen to these words again in a slightly different version. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor and uh, one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Practice hospitality. Love, devotion, honor, great words to live by. Fairly easy things to get our head around. Be devoted to one another, honor one another, love one another, be joyful and patient, be faithful in prayer. Great concepts, Paul goes over them many, many other times. But notice that Paul is not talking here about relationships within a marriage or within a partnership. He's not talking about how we treat our children. He's not talking about anything other than the family here within the church. And we have to remember that, and we have to put that in context. It is the body of Christ, the relationships that we have for each other, that Paul is stressing in this passage. So a moment, imagine for a moment, what would the church really look like if we actually followed what Paul envisions? Maybe we wouldn't have the strife that we see within the Christian church around the world. Maybe we wouldn't have so many denominations that are split apart from each other because they couldn't get along. Maybe we wouldn't have Baptist churches that are being dismissed from the fellowship because we can't get along with each other and we disagree. Paul must be cringing in thinking about the way we have not followed his advice over the years. If we look at some other translations of the Bible, we hear some different words which may, again, help us to really get our head around some of this. Words like be honest, love each other with an honest love, be loving. Wow, what does that imply? The kind of love that's referred to here again is the kind of love that we find in the closest of families. The kind of love that makes us all one. And we are a family here at University Baptist Church. Be humble. Hmm. Here we're commanded to put others ahead of our own self. God 
God's way is that we seek to hear others in every situation in the church. Be diligent in whatever God gives you to do, whatever tasks God lays upon your lap. Don't be a procrastinator. Be about the work of God. Say yes and follow through. Be helpful. That one's rather obvious. Help our fellow believers as needs arrive into the church. Be open. Instead of building walls because we don't agree with somebody, be open. Listen as true friends do, as true family members do. Be kind. Regardless of what somebody else says to you, regardless of how somebody else treats you, regardless of what life throws in your way, be kind. Reach out to brothers and sisters in Christ in a kindly way. And then be compassionate. We're all members of the same body. And as Tommy noted last week, we should have the compassion for our fellow believers that allows us to hurt when they hurt and sing praises when they have joys in their lives. This is part of the reason why at the beginning of our service we take time to greet each other. So that we become one, we become a family, so that we begin to understand and feel and hurt when others hurt. Other words that we see in this section in some verses, be excited. Ah, be excited for the Lord. The, in the verse that I read earlier, it used the word fervor. And the word fervor actually means to bubble over in excitement. And when I read that earlier this week, I thought of a journey that I took several years ago to the little island of Dominica in the, in the uh, middle of the Caribbean. And in the middle of this island is a boiling lake. It is unique. It is special. And you go there, and the lake is just jumping up and down. The water is raising 20, 30, 40 feet in the air and doing this wonderful dance that just mesmerizes and makes everybody happy. Fervor. Do we have that kind of zeal, that kind of, of, of excitement for the Lord? That is what Paul was pushing us toward. He says, be happy in some versions. Believers ought to be happy. We have something that nobody else has. How can we not be happy knowing that the Lord is on our side, knowing that Christ is there for us, that Christ has always been and will always be there to support us. We are saved. We are forgiven. We should be smiling and happy all the time. Other versions use the words, be hopeful. Be hopeful in all that we do. Again, because of what the Lord has given us and what we are able to be assured of in the Lord. We can keep our eyes on the prize. We can be hopeful no matter how bad things get, no matter how unfortunate circumstances seem to be. Hope in the Lord. The Lord walks with us every day. And finally, be prayerful. The idea that if we were involved in a prayerful life together as well as as individuals, that we come together as a family, we support each other, we love each other, Paul wants us to be in prayer. Okay, so far it doesn't sound too bad, does it? Be happy, be kind, be loving, be compassionate, be prayerful. Paul's recipe for a Christian life is really not that tough. But do we follow it? Do we listen to what Paul is saying? And do we actually do it in our lives? A couple of years ago, I read a devotional that looks at Paul's recipe in a rather unique way. You've all seen the signs on the back of trucks that say, how's my driving? Okay. And, and, and unfortunately, sometimes they're not the best drivers. But we, we see these signs on the trucks and it implies that they've done some training, that they're proud of their drivers, that their drivers are doing the right things. And below that, it says, Something to the effect of, if you have problems or if our driver's not doing a great job, call this number. Right? Have you ever actually done that? No, probably not. But, 
The author of the devotional went on to say, hmm, how about if we mimic that as Christians? What if we all had bumper stickers on us? Okay, maybe not on the rear end. Maybe that's not the best place. But if we had a bumper sticker that said something to the effect of, I'm a Christian, how am I doing? How is my demeanor today? If you have problems with me, call and give a number. It's a great idea. It's an interesting analogy, and it scares the heck out of me to think about doing that. Does it scare you too? Why? Because even though the recipe for, for living a Christian life seems so simple, we know that we all fall short of that goal. Do you suppose that listed number would get a lot of calls? I think it would. I think it would get lots of calls, and I'm afraid that God or whoever answers the phone on the other end would probably get pretty perturbed uh, if we have those bumper stickers. So maybe that's not the best idea, but it's an interesting one to think about. Okay, so that's the easy part of Paul's message. Now it gets a little bit harder. Because now he goes on to say, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. Do not be conceited. Okay. I can understand praying. And I can understand loving. And I can understand compassion. But really, Paul? You want me to bless those who curse me. You want me to be happy when somebody yells at me in the congregation? You've got to be kidding me, Paul. Is that really what God wants, or did you kind of miss the message when you wrote this down? Sometimes I wonder about that. About um, 10 years ago or so, my son gave me a copy of Jimmy Carter's book, Living Faith. Many of you read it? If not, I would encourage you to pick up a copy at the library or wherever and read it. Those of you who were in the older half of the congregation, like myself, will remember that when Jimmy Carter was in the Oval Office, that he was oftentimes mocked by the media and by others because while he was in the White House, he not only declared that he was a born-again Christian, and he said that repeatedly, but because he actually tried to live out his faith on a day-to-day -day basis and use it in making decisions as a president. I find it interesting, by the way, that this year, I've heard that many, many times repeated, that people are so concerned about some of the presidential candidates for 2012 because they are declaring their faith, and people are worried that they might actually use their faith in making decisions in the White House. It's okay as long as you agree with my faith and use it, but if you have a different faith, I don't want you in the White House using your faith to make decisions. In the introduction to this really inspiring book, President Carter wrote these words. In this book, I explore some of the ways my Christian faith has guided and sustained me, as well as the ways it was challenged and how it drove me to seek a closer relationship with God and my fellow human beings. President Carter also added a statement a couple of pages later. He wrote this, to me, faith is not only a noun, but also a verb. A statement that gets at the real heart of the Romans text from today. Hear this again. Faith is not only a noun, but also a verb. So what does that imply for us today? It implies that as we seek to do God's will in our daily lives, and live in harmony with each other as a family of God, that we must actively strive to make connections with other members of the body of Christ. One Bible scholar sees it this way. He says, we need to do two things. We need to walk as a family, and we need to walk in fellowship. 
We need to operate as the best possible family that we can be. And we need to understand that we are all cut from the same cloth. We are all saved by the same blood and we are all headed to the same heaven. None of us is above another. And there is no room in Christ's family for one who thinks that he or she is better than anyone else. Live in harmony. Do not be conceited. Finally, now it gets even harder, Paul revs up the, the message to probably what is a breaking point for many Christians, especially if we don't understand the context of this passage. For here he says, do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. And if your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Wow. Rather strong words to try and understand and live by. So again, let me break this down by using verses from another translation. One of them is the idea of walking in forgiveness. Jesus tells us over and over again, there will be times when we are offended by the words and deeds of another. We've all had that happen. Probably more times than we would care to count. But how do we respond to those words? For we are commanded to practice forgiveness, not to engage them in evil for evil. How about walking in faithfulness? We are called to be faithful in the sight of all by living the kind of life that brings glory to God. The life we live should be a thing of beauty to those who observe it, both within the family and outside of the family. And it should be a thing of beauty to God as well. Let our lives be a living example. Another translation uses the term, be peaceful. And when I see those words, I think of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. If you didn't notice, by the way, the new memorial to his life was unveiled uh, last week in Washington, D.C. on the Mall. And it was actually supposed to be dedicated yesterday, except that the dedication was canceled because of Hurricane Irene. So that will be uh, uh, somewhere down the line. But as Dr. King taught us, we are to see that there is peace within the family of God. We are to go the extra mile without demanding the same from our brothers and sisters. We are to offer the apology first without waiting on the other so that reconciliation can begin. We are to take the lead in seeing that there is peace and harmony in God's family. What would happen if we all did that? Other authors use the terms be patient, be positive, be pleasant. Hmm. Last week, we took Nathan down to start a new job at University of Missouri. And for a few hours, it's a long drive down there, for a few hours driving through Indiana and Illinois, Mary Ann rode with Nathan in his car, and I was riding alone. And uh, to get past the boredom of cornfield after cornfield along I-70, I turned on the radio. I'm not a real fan of country music. <laughs> There's a lot of it out there. And if you are a fan, that's fine. But it didn't really catch my attention. So I kept turning the channels, and eventually I settled upon a Christian radio station. And it was wonderful at first. There was some fabulous music. There was a combination of contemporary and classical music. And I was really enjoying it until it got to the top of the hour. And it turned from music to a talk session. 
the commentators, the supposedly Christian commentators on that show, spent the next, well, probably 30 minutes, but I only listened to it for 15 before it faded out, spent the entire time berating everyone and everything that did not fit into their narrow comfort zone of theology. Of course, they started with President Obama, trying once again to convince the world that he is not a Christian, that he's a Muslim in disguise, and he's going to take over the world uh, as a Muslim world. They berated everyone who envisions that gays and lesbians can be children of God, and pastors and churches that dare to agree that they can be children of God. They attacked churches and followers of Christ who seek peace in the world, rather than supporting the wars that we were involved in. And of course, before the time was up, they had to attack environmentalists within the Church of God as well, as being funded by the Antichrist, who was going to destroy this world um, and by, by worrying about all those little creatures that God commanded us to subdue anyway. Needless to say, my blood pressure was rising for the entire 15 minutes. By the time that faded out and I moved on, it took me a while to watch and we went to a rest stop and Marion asked me why I was red in the face and why my blood pressure was high. And it took me a while to settle down for that. This is exactly the type of unpleasantness that Paul was warning the Roman church against and warning us against. The Christians of Rome lived among competing cultures, as we do. They lived among competing loyalties and moralities, just as we do today. But Paul reminds us that it's not enough to just be right. We also have to do right. And we have to demonstrate to the world how we do that. As President Carter reminded us, faith must be a verb, not just a noun. It's an action word. And if it's not an action word in our lives, then we miss the gospel message. Be peaceful, be patient, and walk in humbleness. So where does Paul's message leave us today? I can only speak for myself, of course, but it leaves me with a lot of questions. Like most of us, through the years, I have learned how to pretend to love others, how to speak kindly, how to avoid hurting feelings, and how to appear to take an interest in others, even though I might not really have that interest. Most of us are probably also skilled in pretending to be moved by compassion when we hear of another's needs. Or, when, or to become indignant when we hear about injustice in the world. But God calls us further. God calls us to real and sincere love, not pretend love, real love that goes far beyond that pretense, that politeness that most of us put out front on a daily basis. Sincere love requires concentration. Sincere love requires effort. As humans, we're probably not capable of doing that all the time in every situation. But God calls us through the Apostle's message to at least strive to do exactly that. Genuine love. A love that mimics the love that Christ showed us and the love that surrounds us every day if we allow it to come through. Genuine love. A love that is compassionate not only when it's convenient, but whenever and wherever we encounter another member of the body of Christ. Genuine love. An action word. Action word. That if we apply it appropriately, might just mean that the phone number on that bumper sticker doesn't get any more calls. Let us pray.
gracious and loving God, whose words shared through the Apostle Paul call us to love, call us to humility, and call us to action. Bless this family at University Baptist Church and the wider Christian family that we are a part of. Help us to hear the message and respond in like fashion that we might be the example of your kingdom here in this place, in this age. For we pray in Christ's name.